How do different places make us feel and behave? History and memories can have a psychological impact on our relationship to physical places. Psychogeography refers to an approach to geography that emphasizes drifting around urban environments in order to explore the effect of particular locations on emotions and behavior. The term psychogeography was invented by the Marxist theorist Guy Debord in 1955. He suggested playful and inventive ways of navigating the urban environment in order to examine its architecture and spaces. As a founding member of the avant-garde movement Situationist International, an international movement of artists, writers and poets who aim to break down the barriers between culture and everyday life, de Boer wanted a revolutionary approach to architecture that was less functional and more open to exploration. Guy de Boer defined the term psychogeography as the study of the specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organised or not, on the emotions and behaviour of individuals. One very tangible expression of psychogeographical studies were the series of maps of Paris which de Boer produced in the late 1950s. The production of these maps represented an attempt to disrupt existing representations and convey different visions of the city. Rather than being entirely new products, his psychogeographic maps were thus modified or improved versions of ordinary maps. Although conventional maps convey a certain abstract, geometric kind of truth about the urban environment, the psychogeographical maps were supposed to convey a social, experimental or existential truth. The map of Paris has been cut up in different areas that are experienced by some people as distinct unities or neighbourhoods. The mentally felt distance between these areas are visualised by spreading out the pieces of the cut-up map. However, the arrows serve to relate the different areas and are based on the forces of attraction and repulsion or exclusion experienced through wandering around the space. Ruth Ewan's The Darks is an alternative audio guide to Tate Britain which invites visitors to explore the area around the building. Using the context of its extraordinary and slightly spooky history as the site of the notorious Millibank prison. The Darks this is a tale of two prisons, one real and one dreamed of. Both of the prisons were designed for the site where Tate Britain now stands, right where you are at the moment, on Mill Bank. The Darks uses this format of a standard museum audio guide. The way I work normally is to develop projects in situ that are context specific. This walk begins in the Millbank entrance hall, where you collected this device. The project uses the idea developed by the philosopher uh, Jeremy Bentham for a prison that would be a panoptic prison, where the building would be constructed entirely of glass and metal. Bentham's prison would be a lamp, a palace of looking, illuminating enlightening and reshaping its inhabitants through engineered transparency and surveillance. Human nature would be bent by the power of reason. His plans for the Panopticon were initially encouraged by government, but eventually the turreted, polygonal labyrinth of the Millbank Penitentiary was constructed instead. It's 16 acres of cells and yards inside an octagonal wall. Exit the building through the revolving doors. Walk down the steps. Monday, 30th of September, 1867. I was roused at about 3.45 this morning and instructed to dress in new clothes. We were then marched out of the prison, across the quay and on board the gunboat Ernest. I cast a look behind and even almost now feel the pleasurable sensation which filled me when I found myself on the outside of this gloomy and grim-looking pile. The penitentiary was essentially an experiment. 
a sort of crucible into which the criminal elements were thrown in the hopes that they might be changed or resolved by treatment into other superior forms. At this point where we see probably the strongest kind of physical trace of the prison, um, this ditch here that goes round the housing estate, which is used to dry washing and they have a really lovely community garden down the end there, this is actually the, the moat which surrounded the prison. The outside world rarely penetrates past the moat. Letters in and out are severely restricted, both by rules and the illiteracy of convicts and their families. Visits are rarely permitted. Isolation is part of the prison programme. It was octagonal, so if that's one of the corners and that's one of the sides, well, a fragment of the side, you suddenly realise quite how huge it was. Always the eyes watching you and the voice enveloping you. Asleep or awake, working or eating, indoors or out of doors, in the bath or in bed. No escape. Nothing was your own except a few cubic centimetres inside your skull. After standing here for 76 years, Millbank Prison was demolished. I don't want to give too much away about how it ends, but I think there's definitely a sense of paranoia and the feeling of really being watched and surveyed. This device knows where you are. This device knows what you are doing. I can watch you. Revealing hidden layers of history and memory is conceptually linked to palimpsests. If this work was a palimpsest work, how do you think it could be rendered? Pause here and brainstorm your ideas. Artist Francis Alice feels that most people walk through cities in a state of disengagement, so he chooses to uncover or create narratives by journeying through the streets. Alice's works often begin as simple actions performed by himself or volunteers, which are then documented in a range of media, including photographs, film, and sometimes postcards. Many of his projects involve walks or paseos, in which he navigates city streets accompanied by various accessories that transform the walks into metaphoric journeys. One of his first walks was The Collector, in which he pulled a magnetic toy on wheels through the streets of Mexico City. Along the way, bits of metal attach themselves to the toy, representing the random accumulation of experience. In Paradox of Praxis, the artist pushed a large block of ice down the streets for hours until it was reduced to a puddle. And for the leak, he roamed the streets of Ghent with a punctured can of paint, leaving a sort of Jackson Pollock-like breadcrumb trail back to a gallery space, where he finally mounted the empty paint can on the wall. For the Green Line in 2004, Alice walked around Jerusalem, trailing a ribbon of green paint behind him. He was following the so-called Green Line, which was drawn on a map by Israeli Minister of Defense at the end of the Arab-Israeli War of 1948-49, and has become one of the most contested boundaries in the world. It marked the respective positions of Israeli and Arab forces in the final ceasefire, and has served as a boundary between Israel and the West Bank ever since. Consider what it's like to travel through an underpass. It's an experience that most of us have had. Even if we haven't, it's not difficult to imagine. We all carry around a psychological database of generic images of the world that surrounds us informed by popular culture and the mass media, such as much as by direct experience. Thomas Demand 
taps into this archive of collective recognition with his still photographs and with his first film, Tunnel. So how do you think this work depicts a psychological journey? Pause here and discuss your ideas. Tunnel is intended to evoke the idea or the memory of a journey rather than to simulate the experience of an actual event. It's closer in feeling to the images that form in the mind while dreaming or imagining. The film presumably shows a fast-paced tracking shot through the tunnel in which Lady Diana Spencer, Princess of Wales, died in a car crash. At first the viewer seems to remember seeing these images in the media. But in reality, the set is a true-to-life cardboard mock-up of architectural details. Instead of reproducing reality, Thomas Demand creates perfectly constructed model world. Demand is fascinated by the nature of perception and the way in which media-generated images structure our experience of the world to the point where they become more real than the reality itself. As one critic has described it, in viewing Demand's work, you watch yourself watching. The film literally reflects upon the model of our relationship to images from the mass media. In the process, the construction, a representation and repetition of reality, creates a complex weaving of connections. That the accident used as the theme was the result of a car chase caused by the paparazzi lends the work yet another aspect of the reflection of the media. Ultimately, the work encourages the viewer to reflect on their own perception of reality and recognise the way in which reality is constructed.